morning. If you've been here the last few weeks, you'll know that our Sunday morning theme has been on legends. And you'll have been learning that all of you in this room were created to be legendary, legends in your own right. Um, did you pick that up over the last few weeks? Are you feeling legendary? Are you faith filled for those legendary things that God has ahead for you in your life? I sound like I'm booming up here. Is it all right out there? It sounds okay. All right, good. Fantastic. This morning, though, when we're moving on from the subject of legends, don't worry, you're all still legendary. And I hope that we've learned some great things about the successes and failures of those legends in the Bible that we've looked at over the last few weeks. This morning, we're going to look a little bit at the vision of Shoreline Church. You know, sometimes our vision can get a little bit unclear, can't it? Now, I haven't been to the optician since I was in school. I've not been for an eye test for a long time. But I know that um, it's a good thing to do to check that you're seeing what you think that you're seeing. I remember my brother Andrew getting his first set of glasses, and he was so excited, running around like, it's like the lights have been turned on. I didn't realize trees had individual leaves. I thought it was just a mass of green. Our vision can become a little bit unclear. We can have, if you want, veils fall in front of our vision that mask or block out the clarity of what God wants us to see. So we're just going to look a little bit this morning at the vision of Shoreline Church. If you've got your Bibles with you, please turn to the book of Timothy, uh, 2 Timothy chapter 1. 2 Timothy chapter 1. Now we looked at this chapter at the beginning of January and we looked at the vision of the house at the beginning of the year. And we talked about the vision of the house helping us understand the pattern that God wants us to see lived out through our life. If you just look around the room, you will see the wonderful patterns or uh, styles of fashion we've chosen to wear this morning. Some of us brightly colored, some of us not so brightly colored. All chose some patterns and some fashion that suits us. But there's a pattern that God wants us all to be wearing and living out. The pattern according to what His Word teaches us. There's also a pattern that He doesn't want us to follow. The pattern of this world He doesn't want us to take on. But the pattern that His Word teaches us, leads us, and guides us in and through. So what kind of pattern do we make here at Shoreline Church? Our vision, the things we do, the way the things we do, why we do those things, the more we understand them and intentionally connect with them, we're all, as one body, going to be creating and showing and making the same pattern according to God's Word as it leads, guides, and teaches us. Everybody say pattern. Just look at the person next to you saying, I'm loving the pattern that you're wearing today. <laughs> Great. I just want to read this morning a small part of 2 Timothy chapter 1. Reading from verse 3, if you have your Bibles with you. We thank you, Father, for your word. We thank you that it is living. I pray that each one of us here this morning, our ears, our hearts, our whole being, open to receive from your living word this morning. Amen. I thank you, God, whom I serve as my forefathers did, with a clear conscience, as night and day I constantly remember you in my prayers. Recalling your tears, I long to see you, so that I may be filled with joy. I've been reminded of your sincere faith, which first lived in your grandmother Lois and in your mother Eunice. And I am persuaded now lives in you. What we just read there is a letter from Paul to Timothy. A letter from Paul of encouragement and guidance and affirmation to his friend, Timothy. A letter from Paul, a character at the birth of the early church that was so instrumental that has written huge proportions of the New Testament that we read today. An influential character at the birth of the church as we understand it and sit in it today. 
A letter written to Timothy, another leader at that time that was taking the mantle on, that was guided and invested in by Paul, taking the mantle on of leadership, leading church. A letter from Paul while in a prison. Not like our nice clean prisons, more of a dungeon. Now, I don't know about you, but if I'm sat in a dungeon, as faithfully as I may have served Jesus, as faithfully as I may have followed after God, when I'm sat in a, a dungeon, I'm not first of all thinking about how I might encourage everybody else. I'm probably thinking about who might be coming to visit me in my dungeon to encourage me. But here's Paul in spite of his position, in spite of his situation, in spite of a place that none of us are going to put our hand up and volunteer to be in. Yes, please lock me in a nice, dirty, dark dungeon. He's still about thinking of his friends, other church leaders, people that he can write to and encourage and affirm. We heard a little bit about encouragement from my dad this morning, how important that is. And here Paul's writing encouraging words to Timothy. What can we learn from these words with regards to the vision here at Shoreline Church? Our corporate vision, our understanding of what we're about as a body of believers, a part of the church of Christ across this world. Paul's letter, if we read the first couple of verses, is just an introduction. And then he comes to honoring God and worshipping God in that letter. And of its day, that was a typical fashion for writing letters. When I start writing a letter or an email, it's normally that first bit you get stuck on. Normally, how do you open it? How do you say hello without sounding like you just say the same thing all the time? I hope you're well and the family are good. And you, you know, you try and get a little bit more creative, don't you, with that kind of communication. So Paul was writing a letter that followed a pattern, followed something that was cultural in writing letters in and of its day. And here at Shoreline, I believe it's important that we also take on some things that are in our world of today and use them for the purposes of God. When I grew up in church, it was pretty traditional to go to a midweek Bible study that could have been on any particular thing and a midweek prayer meeting in the evening where one, two, three, maybe four of your lucky people turned up. Sunday morning service, Sunday evening service, maybe you're of that kind of Um, traditional church background too. And if you look at some of the things that we do here at Shoreline Church, some of the things uh, don't fit those patterns, don't fit the traditions perhaps that we're used to seeing in church. Perhaps there's some things at Shoreline Church that are a little bit out of the box or are a little bit, well, are we supposed to do it like this? Are we supposed to have communion the way we do communion? Are we supposed to have a 24-hour prayer event occasionally through the annual calendar? Shouldn't that be just one hour every week? Paul used a pattern of the day just in simply writing a letter of encouragement that fitted their culture and made sense to the person he was communicating to. We also are going to be about the same kind of things here at Shoreline. The pattern of a mission team going to New York Surely it should be to somewhere much poorer, where people have no place to live and no food to eat. But the early church that was dispersed actually lived in a place of poverty and was dispersed to a place of wealth. Rome, it took the mission and the gospel to places like New York. What a privilege we have. I hope we see some of those things that we do creatively within outreach and mission. For example, the Christian Against Poverty Center. What a fantastic ministry that didn't exist some years ago. What a powerful testimony, not just to our community that we're helping some people get out of debt, but we're a part of a national structure of debt counseling where the church is facilitating the whole of our nation with its debt problem. What a testimony we carry as we use creatively the things that God makes available to us today, in today's society. The verses we've just read. Verse 3 says, I thank God whom I serve, as my ancestors did with a clear conscience, as night and day I constantly remember you in my prayers. If we are going to take on the pattern of a shoreliner, 
because you attend Shoreline Church. More definitively, a disciple, a follower of Christ. And being a person of prayer is so very important. Paul writes to Timothy and says, I pray, I'm praying for you. Not occasionally, I'm praying for you night and day. Are we a people of prayer? We sit in a wonderful building, kind of. It's got some positives and some negatives. And that's great, and God provides us with wonderful facilities. If you want to have a peek in this room over here a little later on, some people have done some fantastic work. This was just a regular boiler room. Now it's one of the most classy offices in the whole of Southport. Because some people have given and served. We've got some great facilities, and, and that's wonderful, and that's great, and that's a provision of God. And we pray, and we believe, and we have faith for so much more. But sat on the seats is something more significantly important, is you. And the pattern that you take on as a growing leader in the body of Christ. Leading your own life. Setting an example that influences others for godly purposes. Growing in, in your leadership to be able to take on responsibility and sign up for things like going on a mission. Or joining a leadership team. Or even leading a department. For those kind of patterns to be in your life, for those things to be happening, prayer has to be one of those things. Just like Paul was praying for Timothy. He prayed, don't be anxious about anything. Anybody anxious in here about anything this morning? Maybe your health or somebody else's? Finance, relationships, position. It prays that we should Seek first his kingdom. And then the things we are anxious about, take proper perspective. The things we are anxious about, God can minister to us, strengthen us. Not just directly, but by the body that you're a part of. Speaking words of encouragement. Meeting needs that we each have. It says, if we humble ourselves and pray, if we turn from the wickedness in our life, then forgiveness and healing is ours. If we're praying humbly, if we're praying, help me not do the things that I shouldn't be doing, help me to start doing the things that I should be doing, then anxiety is not going to be a part of our life. And he says, as our forefathers did. Pete, Paul was not writing to Peter about a new, really, a new faith, a new way. He was referring to people in the Old Testament Hundreds and thousands of years before, their faith in God, those men and women of prayer, my, as our forefathers did, as the people around us do today, in faith for those that are going to lead ahead like Timothy, the new emerging leader, be a man of prayer. Vision for our house, to be a place of prayer. Why do we do 24-hour prayer events? Not because they sound nice, but we want to be a house 24 hours a day of prayer. Can you see that in your life? Is prayer growing in you? That prayer of forgiveness, that prayer of thanks and praise, that prayer of making a request. Are we growing as those kind of people here at Shoreline Church? In verse 4 it says, recalling your tears, I long to see you, that I may be filled with joy. Are we passionate people? He said he longed. He remembered tears. There's passion in there, isn't there? From Paul to Timothy. T tears that Timothy shed at times of maybe sorrow and joy that Paul refers to. They were people of passion for one another and the purposes of God. Are you people of passion? Yesterday, I also went to a football match. It's like a second religion here, it's sounding like, isn't it? Just by chance, uh, one of our children got a chance to be a mascot at Everton's match yesterday. So Caleb, our youngest, is about this big. <laughs> he was the lucky one of our four boys that got to be a mascot at Everton's game. I got excited about that. 
Do you know how long his mascot role lasted? About 60 seconds. He's on the pitch and he's off the pitch. But I was excited. I was way up in some stand in the corner and I could only, I probably do need to see an optician. I could just make out a little moving figure there on the side of the, that must be my son. They're all in blue and white, but one of them's him. I'll pretend it's that one. When I first took Caleb to the first football match ever at Everton, we sat right in front of the edge of the penalty box. And when the game is down the other end of the field, the goalkeepers tend to stand in that area. Now, if you speak to Caleb, and he's brave enough to speak back to you, he'll tell you his ultimate hero is Tim Howard, the goalkeeper. Don't know where he's got it from. Since he's been three, he's loved goalkeepers. If you're going to buy him a football kit, it has to be the goalkeeper football kit. And so he goes to the first game, and we sit opposite where Tim Howard stands for the majority of the game. And he was so excited. Tim Howard, Dad, he's there right in front of us. Every question about Tim Howard you could possibly imagine, all the way through the first half. All the players go off. Players come out for the second half. Caleb jumps up on his seat, and he looks out to peer at Tim Howard, who is now the opponent goalkeeper. And his face went from... <laughs> and he, he looked at me with fear and said, Dad, where's Tim Howard gone? <laughs> so I said, it's okay. This change ends, he's down there. So he looked and he's, he, he, the fear subsided. He was okay. His hero was still there. I had a passion inside of me to be at that point in that place yesterday because I love him. It was just 60 seconds on a field. It's no big major deal in all reality. He's walking out holding the goalkeeper's hand. He got to hold Tim Howard's hand he's walking onto the pitch. I know. <laughs> <laughs> just do that again, Grace. Thanks very much. <laughs> Are we, do we have that kind of passion to be with one another? Do we have that kind of passion to celebrate with someone when they have some good news? Do we have that kind of passion for one another to really feel the pain? Sarge has left the room. <laughs> but do we have that kind of passion where we long to be together as his family, worshiping God, standing with one another in faith, Understanding the detail of each other's life as we know one another in small groups or different ministry volunteer areas, missions trips. Do we have a passion to be in that place, really involved in one another's lives? Will we get excited for one another? Not about my stuff and my thing, but for one another. Are we those kind of passionate people? First of all, of course, we've got to have a passion for Jesus. We've got to have a passion for one another. And we've got to have a passion for the lost, for people that don't know Jesus, people not connected to the family of God. Are you passionate about those things? Are you growing in that passion with your walk with Jesus? Are you passion to be with one another, encouraging one another, supporting one another? Are you passion that this church has, that we have for the lost? Part of the pattern of this church is to be people of prayer, is to be people of passion passionate about Jesus, passionate about one another, passionate about the lost. As we move on and read verse 5, it says, I am remembered, I am reminded of your sincere faith, which first lived in your grandmother Lois and in your mother Eunice, and I am persuaded now also lives in you. We have someone called Lois in our church, don't we? Where is she sat? She's hiding. Lois is getting married in the summer. That's pretty exciting, isn't it? To some strapping, handsome, muscle-bound man called David Traxler. His only problem is he's American. <laughs> but Jesus has forgiven him for that, so we also... <laughs> have to forgive him for that. We love Americans. <laughs> Dawn, our worship leader this morning with Gary. Gary's English. He's my favorite. And Dawn's American also. So we do, <laughs> we, we do. 
Lois is getting married in the summer, aren't you, Lois? We're excited about that. Who's doing the wedding? Oh, I'd be nervous about that. Yes. People of faith, here, Paul reminds Timothy of the faith he has seen inside of his life, his faith in God that he saw not just in his mother, but in his grandmother. Looking around your own life, maybe there's people in your family that have stood the test of time, that have, that have been faithful in, in serving church in, in, in their Christian walk day to day, and they've set a great example to you. Do you encourage them? Do you thank them? Do you show the appreciation of their faith in Christ that influenced your life to also take that step of faith? And not just the grandmother, but the mother also. Lois is from a fantastic family. Her parents love Jesus. Her, her siblings love Jesus. She has a great heritage there that she can be proud of and thank God for. How about you? Maybe it's not related family. Maybe it isn't related family as in birth and, and blood relation, but there's family there that someone was like a mother, like a father, like an uncle, like an auntie, like a brother, like a sister, whose example really stirred you and challenged you and led you to a point of come to know Jesus yourself. Can you think of those people? Can you think of how you want to be just like that? You want to be that grandmother, mother, sister, auntie. You want to have that example, that faith that influences others into his kingdom. Are we honoring those that have gone before us? Are we honoring those that are ahead of us? Are we honoring those that have given and sacrificed and prayed and been passionate about your life? And are we desiring to be those kind of people of faith so that we have children, if you want, figuratively speaking, who look to us as a source of great strength and encouragement? As Paul reminded Timothy, you are a man of faith. And that faith born in you in part because of the example that your grandmother and your mother Lois was the other way around. Set for you. Are we wanting to grow in our faith, in our step-by-step -step faith as we walk day by day with Jesus? Do we want to grow in our faith? Are you believing in faith for the things you can't forgive yourself for? that you're going to have forgiveness. So you believe in for the things that somehow you can't accept that God's forgiven you, but actually faith is going to move you to understand He's totally and absolutely forgiven you. Are you going to have faith to forgive others, whether it's resentment or bitterness or anger or stuff in the past you've just not been able to seal and finish? Are you going to allow faith to grow in you so that forgiveness flows through your life to wherever it needs to? Are you going to have faith growing in a belief to see others coming to faith? There are some people probably in the house that you live, in your next door neighbors, in your workplace or your school, that once you prayed for and you had faith that, you know, my life may have some influence, they may see Jesus, and that faith has waned. Maybe that faith needs to be renewed. Maybe there needs to be a recommitment inside of you to believe for more that God is going to do in and through you to see others drawn into his kingdom. Maybe some of you need to be challenging your faith to be able to give. Give within the money that you have. And you look at it and it seems so little. You feel like you don't have enough. But are you the kind of people who want to grow in faith and understand what it is to give in a growing faith with a generous heart, with a passion for God's kingdom? Seeking his kingdom first. And not just giving of our money, but giving of ourself. Giving of our time. Volunteering for different things. Making yourself available to be that servant for that person. Or that ministry. Or that department. Or that area of community or church life. I, I, I'm, not, I'm not good enough. I, I don't have what it takes. I, I haven't been a Christian long enough. Are you going to allow faith to grow in you? And recognize that awesome, incredible legend God created you to be. Allow faith to grow. That's what Paul wrote and encouraged in Timothy. We don't want to be 
conformed in the pattern of our life to this world. We want to be conformed to the pattern of the Word of God and His teaching. And the patterns are there in prayer, in pattern, in, in uh, passion, and also in faith, growing in faith. Shoreline Church is for everyday people. Everyday people doing extraordinary things, serving generously, every day loving, every day. A church known for people of faith. The church in Rome was written about, known throughout all the world because of its great faith. Well, that happens because of the faith inside of each one of us. A church known for its faith, serving in unity. A church that is of prayer, a house of prayer, praying with out ceasing, praying with passion. Church is you. We are the living stones of this church. And it isn't any of those things unless you are living those things out. You're understanding where that challenge is in your prayer life. You're understanding where that challenge is, where there's not that evidential passion for your walk with Christ. There's not that evidential passion for one another. Evidential passion for those that are not of the kingdom. God's kingdom. And faith, has that kind of been put on pause? If you stop looking at how that faith can grow inside of each one of us, in different areas of our life where God wants to be challenged, as we closed our ears or our heart or our mind to be challenged by God in areas that He wants us to grow in our faith, our faith of giving, our faith to see people run into God's kingdom, our faith that we can have a part to play that is superbly important, is incredibly vital? Are we allowing those things to be a part of our life? That prayer and that passion and that faith so that we're wearing the same pattern. That pattern laid on us through God's word. The pattern of his teaching. We're going to share communion in just a moment. So I'm, I'm going to invite the band back just to start pray, uh, playing. And Danny's going to come and lead us through communion in just a moment. And on those three th simple things that I've talked about, from a letter from Paul, that place where things ain't looking too good in a dungeon. He might be in a place where things aren't looking too good. You don't want to look favorably on, on a challenge that God may have for you this morning. But be encouraged by the example that Paul set. Even though he was in that place, he was still passionately connecting with encouraging those leaders that were going to go on after him. Where is it in your life that God wants to challenge you in your prayer life? Where is it that God wants to challenge you this morning about your passion, your passion for him, your passion for one another, those that you sat next to, those that are away from us this morning? And faith, that challenge of faith growing inside of you. Where does God want to challenge you this morning? As we share communion, let's not get distracted by all that goes on around. But as we share communion this morning, let's allow God to challenge us. As we take that bread, as we drink that wine, let's allow God to challenge us in that area that he has for us to be challenged this morning. And let's respond to it. Let's make a commitment in our prayer as we share communion that I'm going to change this thing. I'm going to turn this area around. I'm going to speak to this person. I'm going to believe for more. I'm going to get in that quiet prayer room that I've not been in for so long. I'm going to get to that 24-hour prayer event. I'm going to get connected to a small group, which I've never bothered doing, but I can see how that's going to help me in these areas of my life. I want to connect with others because I'm passionate about the family I'm a part of. Let's hear from God the challenge He has for us and respond. Thanks, Danny.